Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the book of Revelation. This is now session 19. Uh, for the past four sessions, for the past four weeks, Dalton Thomas has been dealing with the third, the fourth, and the fifth seals. Uh, in this session, we're going to begin jumping into the sixth seal. We're going to look at the cosmic signs that just precede the day of the Lord and the return of Jesus. So we're kind of starting to get into some of the good stuff. This is the pinnacle of everything that we are yearning for and longing for. The title of this session is When the Sun Goes Black, the Moon Turns Red, and the Whole Earth Trembles. So before we jump into the actual text, I've got three quick updates announcements uh, that I want to address. So first of all, um, again, it's been over a month since I've been with you all. Many of you have been praying for my wife, Amy. I want to give just a real brief update. Um, since I was with you last, she got out of the hospital. She's had a couple surgeries. They installed an electrical stimulation device at the base of her spine, um, the purpose of which is hopefully to help with the, uh, the severe pain. Uh, is it helping? It's taken a few weeks to kind of get it dialed in and so forth, try to find the right program. Is it helping? The answer is a little bit. Um, ha is there some improvement? Yes, a little bit. She's still in terrible pain. She's still uh, bedridden. And, um, you know, apart from, and this is what we're praying for, is a divine intervention, you know, a supernatural mirac miracle, just miraculous overnight turn type of thing. But just in the natural, apart from that, um, this is going to be, this will be a very slow, difficult crawl out of a very deep ditch. Uh, so please continue to pray for her. And again, I know many of you have been, and I just want to say, the support, the prayers, I mean, just the, the tidal wave of, of support has been really overwhelming and humbling. And so thank you so much, but please do continue to pray for her. Okay, number two, uh, at the beginning of each session, the past few weeks, Dalton has been highlighting and pointing to a $5 monthly campaign for Frontier Alliance International. Uh, we're just asking that you would consider giving a $5 a month donation. Again, this is money that goes to the missionaries on the ground. Frontier missions work in places, parts of the world that are unreached. Uh, you know, the front lines, again, those working in northern Iraq, in Rawandus, in Dohuk, those in Cyprus, those in northern Israel, up in the Golan, reaching the greater Middle East, um, and in parts of the world that we, we won't even reference, we won't mention. Um, but I just want to say with all my heart, I am so privileged and proud to stand with FAI, with Frontier Alliance International, um, and it's a, it's a privilege to stand with all of the people that you don't ever get to see. You know, Dalton uh, is largely the face of FAI. I'm happy to stand with and advocate for uh, FAI. And you know a handful of the workers and the faces, but there's many that you don't see that you don't know. And these are the folks that I'm privileged to stand with more, more than anyone else that are on the ground laboring day in and day out. So again, a minimum of $5 a month. If the Lord leads you to give more, fantastic. Um, but if you're on the FAI app, you can just look below the video. There's a link to go right to that campaign. If you're watching this on YouTube or some other uh, program, go to FAIMission.org. Frontier Alliance International, just FAIMission.org, and you can click through to the $5 monthly campaign. Third announcement, since we're jumping into the issue of the return of Jesus, I want to reference, and I hate to do product placement, but I think, look, I, both of these products, I've one of which is my book, I've poured a lot into, um, and I think it's something that will edify and benefit everyone. So first of all, my newest book, Sinai Design, um, the untold story of the triumphant return of Jesus. This is really three books in one. It's part one, two, and three. Each one of the parts really could be read separate. Part three is all about the return of Jesus, and it looks at dozens of Old Testament texts that are very rarely considered as actually even referring to the return of Jesus, and it just opens up the story of the return of Jesus in a beautiful way. Now, as I say that, let me just say this. Um, first of all, I do put the PDF file of the entire book for free on my website. Um, it's on the FAI app as well as, and I have an app as well, Joel's Trumpet or Wine Press. You go to your app store, you can download the app, and all my resources are there as well as my website. You can read the whole book for free as a PDF file. That said, if you want to get the hardcover, um, it will be available on Amazon in a few weeks. 
And uh, it's, at, it's at the printers right now. The, the second edition is at the printers. And for some reason, COVID, there's, I don't know why, they're saying it's delayed. So it might be a few more weeks, but it's also on my store on my website, um, which is the best way to get it in terms of benefiting me. So again, Sinai Design. And second, I've been wanting to highlight this book for a long time. Please pay attention. Jesus and His White Horse. It's a kid's book by our friends Jake McCandless and Tyson Raines. Uh, Tyson did all of the artwork. Jake wrote the book. Guys, this is absolutely the, the only book that I know that really addresses the return of Jesus for kids. It's fantastic. It's not, you know, like a three-page book. It's got a, li- you know, a bit of meat to it and some theological substance. Just everything about it is awesome. Um, I've actually read it with my youngest kids. I've got five kids, but the two youngest are eight and ten. And I've read it with them a handful of times. Guys, if you don't have this yet, you got kids, grandkids, honestly, get a copy. Um, I'm sure you can get it on Amazon, and I'm sure there's probably dedicated websites just for the book as well. But Jesus and His White Horse. Um, I love talking about the return of Jesus. It's, it's just it's my passion. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump in. So Revelation 6 verses 12 through 14. And I look, I looked when he broke the sixth seal. Again, Jesus breaks the sixth seal. He breaks all of the seals. And there was a great earthquake. So this is a profound uh, timing marker. You see this earthquake mentioned a few times throughout the book of Revelation. Some people will look at different passages and say, well, this earthquake's different than this earthquake. And it does get a little bit complex, but this specific great earthquake that occurs when Jesus returns is mentioned a handful of different times, not just in the book of Revelation, but throughout the Bible. A mighty earthquake will accompany the return of Jesus. And I don't want to, you know, sort of get off on a tangent, but here's my theory. Here's my theory, and again, this is just a theory, um, but when you look at the story of the, the resurrection of Jesus, um, you know, first of all, you had, you had two things happen. You had two earthquakes. One when he was on the cross and died, and you know, like it goes dark and there's an earthquake, but there's also an earthquake when he came back from the dead. And when he died, it was actually such that, and this is such a weird part of the Bible, but where it says that people came up out of their graves. Like there was a, there was a regional earthquake and formerly dead people came and they're walking around. Like that's just one of the weird portions of the Bible. You go, what, what happened there? You know, and then what happened to those people? And do you want to elaborate a little? Like who were some of these old faithful people that came up from the dead? But here's my, here's my theory is, We don't fully understand, I'm going to say, the physics. We don't understand the physics of heaven. Again, from a Western mindset, we tend to think of heaven as the spirit realm where ghosts live, and the earth is the physical realm. You know, it's tangible, it's physical. But from a biblical perspective, heaven is physical. It's spiritual and it's physical. You know, like there are thrones and doorways, and, and, you know, like it's not just a place of immaterial um, non-physicality. Okay, now the earth is also both physical and spiritual. All right, but we don't understand how is it that, you know, when angels show up in the Bible, right, they wrestle, they eat, they eat food, right? They're not just ghosts. They actually are physical beings that wrestle with Jacob. They beat people up, this type of thing. And then they just walk through wall, they disappear. So when I say we don't understand the physics of it, we, like, are they faster than the speed of light? I'm convinced that there is a scientific measurable element to those from, you know, let's call it another dimension. Again, I don't even want to use that language because I don't know if that's scientifically accurate. But there is a reality, a physicality to the spiritual realm. When the Lord moves, when the Holy Spirit moves, oftentimes people react physically. They shake, they tremble, they fall down. I've had some crazy experiences in my personal life. I won't get into the details. When the Lord moves, it actually affects the physical realm. Now, people will say, when they look at it, they'll go, well, that's just an emotional experience. No, it's not, all right? Like, I've had the Holy Spirit surging through my body to where my body's twitching, and I'm not, like, overwhelmed with emotion type of thing. When this happened in the, in the region, the earth trembled. Like, the, the rocks weren't, like, having an emotional experience. They shook. Now. That was 
Okay, again, his death on the cross, and then when he came back, there was another earthquake. When the power of God was released into the body to resurrect him from the dead, it shook the earth. Now think, when Jesus returns, this is the general resurrection. Millions will be raised from the dead. I'm convinced that this earthquake is actually, yes, it's the judgment of God, but it's actually the physical result of the power of God being released into the earth to raise millions, to resurrect and transform those that are alive into their bodies of immortality. So it's kind of neat just to sort of get lost in the, the physicality of it, but there's a mighty earthquake. Okay, and then the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair. You go, what? sackcloth made of hair, you know, like burlap made of hair, like human hair, you know, like, no, this is black goat hair. And I'll actually flash up a couple pictures. So again, in the biblical world, this would have been widely understood and recognized. The Bedouins throughout the, and today in Israel and Jordan and Saudi Arabia and so forth, the Bedouins often make a type of burlap from black goat hair. It's sort of an iconic, classical, classic uh, thing that they've done throughout history. And in biblical times, it was no different. The Bedouins would make these tents out of black goat hair. And again, I've uh, years ago, I mean, 30 years ago in Jordan, I remember um, in Wadi Rum, which is kind of a touristy valley of the moon is what it translates into English, sitting in there with Bedouins in their black tent. So I'll put up a couple pictures just for reference. So the sun becomes black. And that's, it's, you, can, you know, you, you imagine if the sun was behind thick clouds, it would be faint, it would be muted, but you wouldn't say it goes black, right? You would say it's diminished, but the sun goes black. The moon, on the other hand, like if the sun's black, you think, well, surely the moon's going to be black, like because the moon's not nearly as bright as the sun. However, it says the moon becomes like blood. Now, over the past uh, couple decades, there's been numerous times when, you know, you had this tetrad of... Uh, eclipses when the moon sort of turns orange or red and so a lot of people referred to those as blood moons. Those are not the blood moons that's being described here. What's being described here is not just a seasonal eclipse that happens every now and then. What's, what's described here is something profoundly different. And the unfortunate thing is that people would often point to some of these uh, cosmic signs, you know, again, eclipses and different things that are cyclical, and yes, you know, they might align with various Jewish holidays and feasts and this type of thing, but again, those are very different than what's being described here. This is, these are the, the singular, the very specific cosmic signs that precede, as we'll see, we're going to look at a whole bunch of Old Testament texts that precede the day of the Lord and the coming of God from heaven, the return of the Messiah. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth. And this is very um, poetic, so to speak. It says, as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. So you can picture a heavy fig thud falling to the ground. Now, are the stars, you know, which, of course, we know stars are actually suns, you know, right? Like distant. Are they going to fall to the earth and land? No. Are, is it describing comets and meteors and this type of thing, which appear to be stars falling from the sky? Um, I think it's fair to say, you know, it could be any number of these things. It could be just that the stars disappear. If the sun goes black, you're not going to see the stars, so it's as if they've disappeared. It's using poetic language. It's not using overly scientific language, and we don't need to get caught up in demanding that every star is actually not a sun. It's actually up there in the... In the um, the firmament and they're going to fall in this type of thing. Like the earth is not flat, the earth is round, moving on. And then it says the sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up. That's profound. I mean, that's hard to even understand what is being said here. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Okay, so we have a list of... Now, first of all, let me just say, these are literal events. These are literal cosmic signs. These are physical events that will happen in the earth. Okay, it references a great earthquake. It's going to be a great earthquake. That's what it means. The sun will go black. The moon will turn to blood. The stars will disappear. Will there be meteors and comets? And the, possibly. But the stars will essentially, if the sun goes black, then certainly the stars will go black as well. Exactly what it means by the sky splitting is, it's hard to know. I mean, there's going to be tremendous natural disturbances in the sky. Okay, we know that. 
mountains and islands moving, again, massive regional global earthquakes. It's the only way that we could uh, define that. Now, here's what's interesting. So Dalton has been looking at the previous seals, um, the third, the fourth, and the fifth. He's been looking at, you know, I mean, all kinds of natural disturbances. But this next, verses 15 through 17, this next portion, to me, it's really fascinating, and I'll, I'll explain why. So now we have, okay, so we've had a series of, you know, again, wars. We've had the going forth of the Antichrist. We have famines. We've had um, economic disasters. Like, we've had all of these disasters. Now, again, imagine or, or just think of this in terms of COVID. Over the past year and a half, I guess we're at about a little over a year right now with COVID, within the body of Christ, people have had all these debates. Is this God? Is this Satan? Is this just random? Is it man? How do we interpret it? And the answer is, look, it's all of these things. Yes, it's Satan. Yes, it's the Lord. Like, look, even in the book of Revelation, Satan goes forth and he is given authority to persecute the saints for 42 months. But it's Jesus who opens the seal and releases that. So who's in charge? God's ultimately in charge. Is it the work of Satan? Yes. Like, sometimes these things are very complicated. Okay, now here's the thing. The kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. So in light of all of, you know, the sun going black, the moon turning blood, the earthquakes, all the people, small and great, throughout the earth are terrified. They're actually hiding. They're hiding themselves from what's unfolding on the earth. And they say, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? Why is this so fascinating? Okay, with COVID, you know, there's debate in the church as to whether or not it's God or Satan or man or, you know, within the world today, uh, unbelievers are going to say, this is like Mother Earth punishing us for not treating her properly. Like, it's interesting the way people ascribe personality to Earth and she's, or it's karma. You know, they, they have all their different explanations. When we get to this point, when the sixth seal is opened, unbelievers, unbelievers, okay, they're not, the, these are those for whom the wrath of the Lamb is coming to punish them. They know full well exactly what's happening. According to this text, unbelievers, kings, from, again, from the greatest to the, to the smallest, they know full well that what is unfolding is the activity of he who sits on the throne and what's about to be poured out is the wrath of the Lamb. How do they know that? How do they know that? I would say, first of all, because what's finally unfolding here is far more profound. See, with the third, fourth, and the fifth seals, in a lot of ways you could point to famines, economic difficulties, calamities, dictators. Like, you can point to almost any time in history, and you could point to those sort of things, elements of those things. It's almost like they're not anything new. They're new in that these are the... The, uh, they all come together, you know, they're all, um, they take place at this, you know, in real succinct uh, time, and they're more severe, you could argue, than previous times in history. But individually, none of these things are new. When you get to the sixth seal, even unbelievers go, this is God, he who sits on the throne. Like, this is not, there's no more question, even among unbelievers, in terms of, is this God or is it uh, Mother Earth? No one's going, oh, Mother Earth is punishing us because we didn't recycle and we ate too much meat. Okay, they go, the one that sits on the throne is doing this, and the lamb. Now, so it's the severity of what's taking place, but I would argue there's another dimension that we're going to get to, we're going to discuss. So I want to just flash up a uh, simplified timeline of the book of Revelation. I've uh, brought this up in one of the introductory sessions. The reason to me that the sixth seal has to happen right at the end of the final seven years is because there are simply too many texts that demand that that's where it's placed. As we'll see, these cosmic signs point to the imminent, the imminent return of Jesus, the day of the Lord. Now again, the day of the Lord it, you have sort of the narrow day of the Lord, and you have the broader day of the Lord. 
Um, the return of Jesus, I've said multiple times, is a complex series of events that unfolds over time. It doesn't just happen in a, in a flash. Um, he returns. There are events that need to take place. After he returns, the wrath of God will be personally executed and carried out by Jesus himself. This is the way that he has always worked out through history. He doesn't just snap his fingers and everything is just instantaneous. I mean, throughout redemptive history, right? Like he took on flesh. He lived a life and this type of thing. So also the return of Jesus will be fairly complex. However, when you look at passages, again, you know, the Antichrist will be given authority for 42 months to persecute the saints, to wear down the saints. That's 42 months. That's three and a half years. The return of Jesus happens after the tribulation. Like you have to, it, you're, we're really forced to place the sixth seal at the end of the final seven years, in my opinion. Again, the classic pre-wrath model will always point to the passage which says, unless those days were cut short, so they'll say the full 42 months aren't completed, but then you're still left with the passages that say the Antichrist will be given authority for 42 months. So there's some tension there, but I personally would move the sixth seal up to the end of the final seven years. I just, I feel as though too many texts demand it. Um, we're going to look at some, uh, just a handful of the primary texts throughout the Old Testament that describe the day of the Lord. And the reason we're going to do that is because as we'll see, Again, any Old Testament literate Jew who grew up on the Old Testament, who grew up reading their Bible, when they get to Revelation 6 and they read the sun going black, the earth shaking, the moon turning to blood, they immediately, their mind is immediately thinking of a handful of key Old Testament texts which are intricately tied to the day of the Lord. You can't separate them from the day of the Lord. So they, when they read these things, they go, okay, the day of the Lord. Anyone who's old, familiar with the Old Testament, familiar with these texts is going to think the day of the Lord. Now here's the thing with regard to the day, day of the Lord. We just described what it is. God comes from heaven to judge the wicked, to save the righteous. It's the return of Jesus. Okay, so let's start in Isaiah 13. This is one of the most important Day of the Lord texts, uh, prophecies. We're not going to read the entire chapter. It's talking about this judgment on Babylon. And we're going to start here. It says, Wail, for the Day of the Lord is near. Okay, now what's interesting, when you see the term, the Kingdom of God, in the New Testament, you see Jesus is preaching the Kingdom of God. And he says the Kingdom of God is at hand. Most Christians today interpret that as meaning, well, it's so close you can just reach out and grab it. It's within us. It's all around us. That is not what Jesus was saying because almost inevitably whenever you see sort of a teaching on these texts, whether it be John the Baptist or Jesus saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, they almost always leave off the word repent. What Jesus was saying when he said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand is the exact same thing that Isaiah was saying wail, repent, mourn, tear your garments, for the day of the Lord is near. Okay, the point is not saying that it's, you know, within a few days, within a few months, within a few years. The issue is an issue of urgency. The issue is saying repent because the day of the Lord is looming, it's barreling down on all of humanity. No one can escape it. Whether you're dead and in the grave or whether you're alive at that time, it is coming. It is urgent. So it's an issue of urgency. When Jesus said, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand, it was the same thing. He was not saying it's any day now about to break out. It's so close you can reach out and grab it. A new era had broke. No, Jesus was simply reiterating the same thing that Isaiah and Joel and Zephaniah and all of these other prophets said when they said the day of the Lord is near. The kingdom of God. Okay, the day of the Lord signals the dawning of the kingdom of God on the earth. And from the time of Jesus until the kingdom of God is actually established on the earth is at least 2,000 years. So the kingdom of God is near one of the most widely misunderstood passages. He's just repeating what Isaiah and the prophets of old have already said for a long time. But, it, but you, you can't miss the point of repent. And why? Because this day is coming when everyone will be judged. Everyone will stand before the judgment seat of Jesus. Okay, God has appointed a man to judge the living and the dead. And as I always like to say, the internet histories of everyone will be shouted from the rooftops. And not just the internet histories, but our thought histories, our secret histories, our lives will be laid bare and exposed before everyone. Now, we're saved by the blood of Jesus, but we will give an account for the deeds done in this body, whether good or bad. And we will be rewarded or 
not receive rewards based on our faithfulness or our lack of faithfulness. And it's a terrifying thing. Who can stand? Who can stand apart from the blood of Jesus? Okay, so wail for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as a destruction from the Almighty. It's a negative thing. The day of the Lord is overwhelmingly described as a negative thing. Therefore, all hands will fall limp and every man's heart will melt. I've seen different uh, folks, different teachers who have a calling, um, a ministry to teach on these things, to emphasize these things. I've, I've seen people sort of declare these things with a certain measure of arrogance, a certain measure of macho attitude, like, I am familiar with these texts, I preach these texts, you shouldn't be afraid, you know, this type of thing. Look, like, I, I want to, I'm, I'm balancing a fine line here. Um, over the past few, couple months, you know, again, with my wife's uh, tribulation, I've had people say like, oh, I know it's horrible, but the peace of the Lord uh, can be with you and to walk, you know, as you walk through it and you'll have a, a peace that surpasses all understanding and that type of thing. And I go, well, yeah, it's when you have the Holy Spirit, you have hope. We have something much better than those who don't have hope. But when your spouse is in such severe pain, such unrelenting, horrible pain that they're basically begging you to let them die. You're not going, oh, I just have so much peace. I just, you know, I have peace. The serp- I'm, it is well with my... No, like you're in agony. When my wife is in horrible, unrelenting pain and even fentanyl and morphine are not killing the pain. And you're crying and, this, and the doctor's saying, there's really nothing we can do. Like, you're not just, I have peace that surpasses. Like you're in agony. What this text says is all hands will fall limp in that day. Don't think that if you're familiar with and you're preparing your heart that you're going to face that day and just be like, ah, all those other people that didn't prepare, they're suffering, but I'm just going to cruise through it because this is my message, this is my zone. No, it says all hands will fall limp. Look, we're going to make it through this by the grace of God, not our own strength, not our own cockiness, our own macho attitude. Again, overcomers will overcome in weakness, in his strength. And I can tell you, you know, just the past several weeks in particular, the past six months, my wife's been really sick. I mean, she's had this disease for, you know, most of our marriage, but it's the past six months that it's just uh, suddenly become a thousand times worse. I've been weak. I've been at the end of my rope feeling like the Lord's just dangling you over a cliff going like, I can't do this. But his grace gets us through and it feels like, you know, I don't feel strong in the least bit. And um, I think from the perspective of the Lord, I think that's a good thing. But I just, I want to appeal, particularly men, put aside all macho, cocky, like I've got this thing, I'm preparing, I've got it. No, you don't, the Lord's got it. But he is going to humble every single one of us. All hands will fall limp, not just the wicked. The wicked will be far more terrified. You know, like when it says men's hearts will fail them in those days for fear of what's coming upon the earth, that's not just unbelievers. When you're loved, I don't care if you're a believer or not, when your loved ones die and suffer, when you lose your house, you know, like you lose all your property, you, everything's confiscated, even the strongest, their hearts will fail them. And that's not something to say, yeah, you know, I told you so. Like, I, my heart didn't fail. Say, thank, there before the grace of God, go you. All hearts, all hands will fall limp. Every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Now, again, the unbelievers will be far more terrified. But what's coming is terrifying. The day of the Lord is not something to enter with a haphazard um, cavalier attitude. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces of flame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Again, he couldn't be more clear in terms of the nature of the day of the Lord. It's cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation. And yes, the emphasis is on exterminating, on purging, on purifying. It says he will exterminate its sinners from it. Verse 10 through 13. Now, why am I connecting Isaiah 13 to Revelation 6? For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises. The moon will not shed its light. 
So this classic language of the sun going dark, the moon turning dark as well, you have a handful of passages that when you read Revelation 6, you immediately, your mind should go to. And one of these is certainly Isaiah 13. Then I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I'll put an end to the arrogance of the proud. All of us are arrogant. All of us are proud. The Lord will humble all of us. He will purify all of us so that we won't have confidence in our own flesh. We'll have confidence in him alone. It's terrifying. Being pruned. Imagine being an apple tree, you know, pruning branches, your life being pruned, your pride, your ministry, your finances, your family, your health. When pruning is no fun. Being purified is no fun. No one goes through it and rejoices. Yeah, you can a little bit on the surface, but when you're really pruned, it's not enjoyable. The Lord will abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal men more scarcer than pure gold. So many of the inhabitants of the earth will die that men will become scarce like, like gold. I mean, you know, like rare gems and, and precious metals. Like that's very specific. And mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble. The earth will be shaken from its place. The fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. Again, so clear day of the Lord language, the cosmic signs. You're going to when you read Revelation 6, you're going to think Isaiah 13. You have to take all of the language of Isaiah 13 and insert it there at the sixth seal. Okay, the day of the Lord's burning anger. Isaiah 24, verses 19, 19 through 23. The earth is broken asunder. The earth is split through. The earth is shaken violently. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. You know, the earth itself is like a drunkard, for its transgression is heavy upon it. So it will happen in that day, in that day, very specific phrase, that the Lord will punish. Now get this, this is amazing. He will punish the host of heaven. So he's punishing the principalities, the watchers, the rebellious fallen divine beings, so to speak. The New Testament calls them the principalities and the kings of the earth on the earth. Rulers in the heavenly realm and on the earth. The, earth. the Lord is punishing. He's purifying things both in heaven and on the earth. It's not just on the earth. They will be gathered together like prisoners in a dungeon, and they will be confined in prison after many days. In other words, this is like in the latter days, Isaiah says, they will be punished. People say, oh, you know, there's no punishment in Sheol or this type of thing. No, the prophets speak about punishment for the principalities as well as the wicked on the earth. That's why when Jesus gave the parable of Lazarus and, the Lazarus and the rich man, there was torment, torment for the wicked. Don't ever think that um, the fate of the wicked is simply ceasing to exist upon death, closing your eyes and it's all over. That's really not punishment. That's, um, that's getting your teeth pulled. Go to sleep, don't worry about it. There is actual torment for the wicked. Then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed. There it is again. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before the elders. So here again, you have the language of the return of the Lord. He is present. His feet are on the ground. He is ruling and reigning on Mount Zion. This time, in that day, the punishment of the wicked, the rulers in the heavens and the kings on the earth, and they will be punished, and he will be reigning on Mount Zion. Okay, so it's the, the wrath of God, the wrath of the Lamb. Yes and the return of Jesus, and these things are all intricately tied together. Isaiah 34, again, one of the um, most important day of the Lord passages in the prophecy of Isaiah, verses 4 through 8. And all the host of heaven will wear away. So again, the host of heaven, it's like the stars of heaven. Sometimes it's used for the rulers, the principalities. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. So there's the language of the sky rolling up like a scroll that Revelation draws from. And their hosts will wither away as a leaf withers from the vine, as one withers from the fig tree. There it is. So the language of a leaf, you know, a beautiful leaf in summer then curls up and becomes like nothing. You're saying the stars will be like that. It's like they'll disappear, they'll wear out. It's using poetic language, but yet it's alluding to very real natural events that will take place. He says, my sword is satiated in heaven. Behold, it shall descend for judgment upon Edom. This is one of the texts where the Lord actually names names 
of his, the enemies of his people, the specifics concerning the peoples that he will judge. The Lord is not only going to judge Edom, he will judge all the wicked, but he does name names, sort of highlight regions, peoples, tribes, uh, um, you know, those that allow their hearts to become vessels of hatred for his people Israel. Not just Christians, but his people Israel. Even in unbelief, the Lord continues to refer to them as his people. How do you know that? Well, we'll look at a few, few passages. He says, upon the people. So he, now it's a parallelism. He says, it's going to descend upon Edom in judgment, upon the people that I have devoted to destruction. A lot of people say, well, those that, um, <coughs> those that espouse the Roman Antichrist theory, and they go, no, the Islamic Antichrist theory doesn't work. They go, all of the Roman European followers of the Antichrist will be gathered in Edom, and they'll be judged there. But they're not actually the Edomites. But here, Isaiah says that the Lord's judgment will descend upon Edom, the people that I have devoted to destruction. Yes, it's the people that live in the land. They're not primarily European travelers that are down there persecuting the Jewish people. It's the Edomites. It's the people in Edom. And again, it's the people that have this hatred for his people, Israel, as well as all that attach themselves to the Messiah of Israel. It uses the language, the sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It's using the language of the judgment. The sword of the Lord it, it descends in judgment, and it's like a sacrifice. So it's sated with fat, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of kidneys of rams, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra. Basra being the region of Edom. For the Lord has a day of vengeance. The day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is the day of vengeance. For what? For the recompense or the controversy, the cause of Zion. So one of the primary reasons why the Lord comes back to descend in judgment on his enemies is for the controversy of Zion. Now, in the previous session, Dalton talked about the fullness of martyrs. And this is one of the primary themes of the book of Revelation. And I wholeheartedly agree with Dalton that the martyrs described there in the book of Revelation, the great crowd, those are those that have come out of the great tribulation. They're not tribulation saints while the whole church was caught up, right? This is not the church that's been raptured. It says they come out of the great tribulation. It doesn't say they were raptured prior to, previous to, before the tribulation. No, they come out of the tribulation. How? Through martyrdom. Okay, so, you know, you've got Matthew 24, 14. Well, you've got Matthew 28, which is the Great Commission. This gospel shall be preached in all the world. Uh, I'm sorry, go therefore and preach the gospel, baptizing. That's the Great Commission. In Matthew 24, 14, you've got the Great Commission prophecy. This gospel shall be preached in all the world as a testimony, and then the end will come. So a lot of uh, missions folks, they'll say, well, we need to complete the Great Commission. And then the Lord will return. I go, yeah, that's one of the goal posts, one of the timing markers that needs to be complete. But almost no one points to Revelation 6.11, which says that it's not until the full number of martyrs come in that all these things will be complete. So there's not just that the gospel needs to be proclaimed, but the full number of martyrs need to come in, needs to be filled up. It's important to sort of highlight some of the primary reasons he comes back because the full number of martyrs has finally come in. And he comes back because his people, Israel, their back is against the wall. He comes back to save them. Israel is his people, and the believers, the followers of Jesus are his people. And when he returns, all of those that are left of Israel, they all then come to know him. But they're still in their natural bodies. So there's some complexity there. Obadiah 15, um, a very important verse that highlights the nature of the day of the Lord. It says, the day of the Lord draws near on all nations, on the Gentiles. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Obadiah, again, is about the kingdom or the mountain of Edom and the kingdom or the mountain of Israel, of Zion. Okay, so it's dealing with Israel, God's people, and their enemies. And the Lord is going to come back and judge them. Well, in the same way that Isaiah 34 was talking about judgment descending on Edom, Israel's enemies, and the Lord coming back because he has a controversy. He comes back for the cause of Zion, a day of vengeance for his people. Obadiah 15 says the same thing, basically reiterates the same point. Um, the day the Lord draws near on the nations. As you have done to my people, now it's going to come back. As it says in Joel, you think you are repaying me, the Lord says? No, I will swiftly and speedily repay everything that you have done on your own heads. Okay, it's kind of like a form of Old Testament Biblical karma, if you will, but it's, it's not karma. It's simply justice. 
Ezekiel 30, very similar. Verses 2 and 3. Son of man, the Lord says to Ezekiel, prophesy and say, Thus saith the Lord God, wail. Wail. Same thing Isaiah said back in Isaiah 13. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near. Ezekiel, Isaiah, all saying the same thing. Repent, weep, wail, mourn. Even the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the Gentiles, a time of doom for the nations. So the primary way that the day of the Lord is described, it's described in many different ways, but it's a day when God comes down from heaven. Again, um, I didn't touch on it, but Isaiah 34, for what it's worth, is a clear sister passage with Isaiah 63 which portrays the Lord literally marching on the ground. Again, one like a son of man. Jesus, Yeshua, the Messiah, in the flesh, on the ground, marching physically through the land of Edom, soaking his robes with the blood of his enemies. And so you can't read Isaiah 34, the Lord has a great sacrifice in Basra, without seeing it uh, as well in Isaiah 63 and seeing those two passages go together. And what does he say at the end of Isaiah, well, not at the end, but in the middle of Isaiah 63, he says, very similar to at the end of Isaiah 34, he says, for the day of vengeance was in my heart and the year of my redemption has come. Why are you soaked with blood? Like, why so bloody? Because he's been waiting, he's been yearning. In the same way that the righteous are waiting, he also has been waiting. It says in Hebrews, he has been sitting at the, he made atonement once and for all, he ascended into heaven and he has been sitting at the right hand of the Father. Yes, he's interceding, but he's also waiting from that time forward until the time comes when he will crush his enemies under his feet and make them like a footstool for his feet. Okay, so similarly, Ezekiel 30, Amos 5, 18. Now this is an interesting twist and this is really instructive, I think for all of us because we are susceptible to the same mistakes that Israel is, that various individuals within Israel have made down through history. Um, this past election season was a really good example in the United States where you think you're on the right side and you know you look at social media and so forth and you know let, let, let's just say this let me start out and say like you know to use the example of Joshua you know whose side are you on? The Lord goes you know, I'm not on anyone's side. I'm coming back as the conqueror. So let's say you cite that verse. And in the United States, a Republican will be like, well, you're trying to tell me that Jesus is not on our side? You're trying to say he's on their side? Their side? Like, they're for abortion. They're for this. They're for all these wicked things, right? But when the, and, and I'm going to go, yeah, I think all those things are wicked. But here's the thing is when Satan can get you to put all of your attention on what they are doing, you don't pay attention to the things that need to be purged and purified in your own life, in your own political party, right? And so this is the easy, so this is why Jesus says, before you try to remove the, the speck out of your brother's eye, get the log out of your own, pay attention to yourself, focus on you repent for you. You can't make other people repent, you know, railing on social media, where, dear Mr. Internet, have you seen what these people are doing? It's hard. Yes, it's crazy, I agree. But there's really not much you can do, and complaining and griping on social media isn't going to change anything. There is something that you and I can do, and that's we can focus on and repent of our own sins, okay? I think we can all agree on that. Israel, now again, it's so easy to do. If, let's say you're a Jew and you're reading all of these prophecies about how the Lord's going to come back, he's going to vindicate you, he's going to destroy your enemies. You've got numerous passages that you can point to. But if you're not careful, we can miss one of the most important points, and this is a point that Amos says. Amos says, in uh, the Lord speaks through Amos in chapter 5, verse 18. Alas, you who are longing for the day of the Lord. He goes, okay, listen up, all you who think, you know, I can't wait for the day of the Lord. I'm longing for the day of the Lord. He says, for what purpose will the day of the Lord be to you? It will be darkness and not light. So here's Amos saying to Israel, he goes, look guys, don't think this is just judgment for the Gentiles. It's going to fall on Israel too. Jacob's trouble is coming as well. You will be purged just as well as the unbelievers. And if you're a Christian right now, don't think for a second that the day of the Lord is going to come to purge all of your enemies and the political party that you disagree with. The Lord is coming back as a flaming fire to purge everything in all of us and that should terrify every one of us unless you're perfect because i know i'm not then you should ha you have something to fear 
legitimately. I mean, the fear of the Lord is a good thing. It's a holy thing. And I genuinely need to apply it to my own life, and I trust that you do as well. What will that day be? It will be a day of darkness and not light. Now, out of that will come goodness. Out of the purging, out of the refining. Those that submit themselves to the purging and the refining, yes, it'll be good. But it doesn't feel good at the time. It never Pruning never feels good. You look at the apple tree a year or two later, after the pruning has happened, it's bearing all kinds of fruit. But at the time of the pruning, it's a horrible-looking thing. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. Now, again, another sort of twist. Amos 5, it's a bit of a, you know, kind of a spin, uh, as I say, an M. Night Shyamalan twist. Suddenly the Lord kind of twists the script. He goes, yeah, I'm coming back to judge the wicked. Yes, it's going to burn for sinners, but don't think it's going to go great for you necessarily. It's a, it's a dark time for the earth. For, all in ha- for everyone that's imperfect, it's going to be tough. That's an incredible twist. Joel 2, here's another huge issue. When we're discussing the day of the Lord, the return of Jesus, the breaking of the sixth seal, huge issue. When we're talking about the day of the Lord, what is another big issue that any Old Testament literate Jew is going to be thinking of? Joel 2, verse 28 through 32. What's going to happen in that day, the day of the Lord, in that season? The Lord says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on all humanity that your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. I will even pour out my spirit on the male and the female servants in those days. I will display wonders in the heavens. Now here's the language of Revelation 6. Blood, fire, columns of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. This is really the most specific reference that we've looked at so far. And yet that happens in the context of the day of the Lord And you've got all this other language of the Lord pouring out his spirit and prophesying. And if you're a cessationist watching this, I apologize, but the gifts of the spirit have not ceased. Is there a lot of goofiness that takes place in the name of being the gifts of the spirit? Absolutely. Is the Lord still going to pour out his spirit in the last days, in the context of the day of the Lord? Absolutely. So it's not just the judgment and the wrath and the anger of God. It's also, arguably, one of the greatest, most profound outpourings of the Holy Spirit, if not the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in human history. That means revival at the same time that there's a great falling away. You see, when we study the book of Revelation, I find there's these camps. People go, it's all negative. It's all falling away. It's the great apostasy. And then you get the charismatics, and they go, no, there's going to be this great end-time outpouring. Guys, it's both. Scriptures support both, and they can happen at the same time, and they will. There's, it's going to be messy. This is the way life is, guys. Like, it's not like life's messy, life's messy throughout history. You know, the 1800s, life's messy. The 19, the, you know, the 20th century, 21st century, life's messy. All of a sudden we cross into the end times. Everything is clean and clear and polarized. And either you're on this team or you're not. No, life is going to continue to be messy right up until the return of Jesus. It's going to continue to be complex. Yes, there's going to be the great falling away. Yes, there is going to be the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Yes, there's going to be the judgment of God, the humbling of all mankind. And yet we're going to see in the body of Messiah, in the church, some of the most glorious outpouring, in-gathering, harvest that we've been longing for and crying for all of our lives. All of these things together. Scripture supports all of them. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, for there will be an escape. Now it's talking about Israel. For those on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, as the Lord has promised, among the survivors, those who escape, the survivors, they will be saved. Okay, And the Lord will pour out his spirit. And this is not just after he returns. Because it, it, you know, you'll get some people say, no, after he returns, he'll pour out his spirit. Yes, he will. But there's actually an outpouring of the Holy Spirit before the great and terrible day of the Lord, which is what it says. And we have precedent, not just in Joel 2, we have precedent in Acts 2. We have scriptural support in Acts 2, which is where the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And Peter interpreted that. He pointed to Joel 2 and he goes like, this is basically a prefigurement of what we see in Joel 2. But he was not saying this is the final fulfillment of Joel 2 because you didn't have the accompanying day of the Lord signs, the blood going, 
the, the moon turning to blood, the sun going dark, and all those things. So Peter wouldn't have said, this is the fulfillment, it's all over, it's all said and done. He's like, hey guys, this is basically Joel 2, but the ultimate is yet to come in the context of the day of the Lord. Just before the day of the Lord, the Lord is going to pour out his spirit as he did at Pentecost a mighty revival, a great harvest, an end time move of the Holy Spirit is coming. We need to be preparing our hearts for all of these things. In Acts 2, 15 through 17, Peter says, look, you, these people, they're not drunk. You know, you guys are looking at, their, you know, whatever, however they were acting, it was kind of freaky. And people thought, man, were they drunk? He goes, they're not drunk, as you suppose, as you're speculating. It's only nine in the morning. Um, for some drunks, that's not a problem. Um, he says, on the contrary, this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. It's an end time outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As it will be in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Now again, Peter would not have, within Hebrew thought, simply because something was fulfilled here, it doesn't mean it's all done and over. Um, because this promise has a clear eschatological future day of the Lord, end time, age ending timing context. So yes, we saw this great outpouring at Pentecost, and yes, we will see it again. Then you get to Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31, and this is so critical in terms of understanding the timing of the sixth seal, in terms of understanding how Jesus had already defined it. And pay attention, if you're um, pre-trib, do pay attention to this. Verse 29, Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of heavens will be shaken. So Jesus is making reference to many of the Old Testament texts that we've just looked at. Revelation is essentially just repeating what Jesus has already said. So, but Jesus places these things after the tribulation, at the end of the tribulation, okay? And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth, which of course in context he's quoting Zechariah, which is all the tribes of Israel, all the tribes of Jerusalem, the inhabitants of Jerusalem is what it says. They will mourn. It's, it's a very actually Jerusalem-centric text. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, just the fulfillment of all messianic prophecy, Daniel 7 and so many other things, with power and great glory as he did at Sinai, shining forth, radiating from the south. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now, our pre-tribulational friends will say, well, the elect here refers to Israel, and he's just gathering them from all over the earth back to the land of Israel. But elect here doesn't refer to Christians. I go, let's just look at the primary way that term's used throughout the New Testament just a few verses prior in verse 24. False Christs and false prophets will arise, show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. Now virtually everyone that expounds upon that passage will say the elect here refers to believers, Christians. But then they get a few verses later and say, no, that elect doesn't refer to Christians. I go, what? Clearly this is referring to if, if it were possible to deceive the elect, but it's not. They won't, be, they won't fall prey to the deception of the Antichrist. No. And then later, when it, just a few verses, when it refers to the elect, it's still referring to believers. That's when they will be caught up. It, it's using clear rapture language. After the tribulation, he returns. When does Paul say relief happens? He says, we will, we will receive relief when the Lord appears from heaven in blazing fire. Right? That's visible. That's his visible return. That's not seven years before the tribulation. As Jesus said, it's after the tribulation. And I'm going to have to go with what Jesus says. Romans 8, how does Paul use the term elect? Verses 32 and 33. The Lord who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who's the elect here? The church, it's believers, it's followers of Jesus, the elect. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Romans 11, 5 through 7, in the same way, there is now also a present time, a, cho a remnant chosen by grace. He's talking about Israel. Now, if it's by grace, it's not by works. Otherwise, grace ceases to be grace. What then? Israel didn't find what it was looking for, but the elect did. Who found what they were looking for? The elect, those that were chosen. Israel didn't, the elect did. The rest were hardened. So those that were chosen, those that were elect, followers of Jesus here are called the elect. Colossians 3, 12 through 13. So as those who have been chosen, 
of God, elect, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility. Again, he's referring to Christians. If we are consistent in our interpretation of these terms, there is no reason in the world to believe that Matthew 24, when Jesus refers to these cosmic signs and the catching up, that he's referring to anything other than Christians being gathered together in the sky in the same way that the rapture is described elsewhere. And I know that's a real bone of contention among our pre-tribulational brethren, but to me it's impossible to get around. Now again, I'm going to end it here. I'll flash up just another um, picture of the chart, again the final seven year period. The sixth seal has to be at the very end of the final seven years. Again, the Antichrist is given authority for 42 months to persecute the saints. And as Jesus said, it's after the tribulation, after the persecution of the Antichrist, that these things will happen. Now, in next week's session, I'm actually going to sort of deviate a bit. I'm going to sort of leave the book of Revelation and almost kind of do a bonus session. But in light of the fact that Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, fits so perfectly here at the sixth seal, I want to take some time to discuss what Jesus refers to as the sign of the coming of the Son of Man. I want to look a in a little bit more detail at the return of Jesus. And um, I think it'll be a real treat to everyone. And um, sort of, look, the return of Jesus is our hope. That's what we're looking forward to. And I just like talking about it. I like getting excited about it. I've been going through a real hard time. And I know, you know, I'm sure many of you have as well. And there's nothing that's more encouraging than just getting excited, visualizing, thinking about meditating, chewing on, pondering the return of Jesus and the day of our deliverance. So we're going to do that. So amen and amen. Uh, I'm going to end it right here. Um, thank you so much for being with us. I do look forward to seeing you next time. Uh, have a great week. Until then. Maranatha.